Good afternoon. Uh, good morning to my friends further east in the Americas and uh, good evening to my friends, excuse me, further uh, east if, if you're still with us on this um, Friday evening. It's great to be with you for the fifth annual Oxford Arbitration Day and I'd like to thank at the outset the organizers, my fellow panelists and you, the members of the audience. My name is Brendan Casey and I'm an attorney with Aiken Gump, Strauss, Hauer and Bell based here in our Geneva office. And it is my pleasure to moderate this panel. Our panel session this afternoon will deal with the topic of interim measures in international arbitration. This is uh, quite admittedly a broad topic with a number of subordinate subtopics or issues um, which fall under the wide umbrella of interim measure. If one wanted to, one could spend an entire conference devoted to the issue of interim measures, but please don't worry and bear with us. We won't spend the next eight hours discussing interim measures in international arbitration. And likewise, we don't plan to spend our next hour and a half trying to fit in eight hours of material. So please bear with us and I hope that you enjoy what will be a more surgical panel moving between the key issues, hot topics, and issues of special attention under the umbrella of interim measures. This is and is meant to be an interactive panel, not just between the panel members and myself, but also between you, the members of the audience. And so with that, I hope if you have not already, you please use the chat function on the right side of your screen to ask any questions you have with respect to topics that are discussed by the panelists. And we'll do our best to address those questions as they come in. As a very preliminary remark, when we speak about interim measures, we're discussing of measures which are ordered by a competent court or arbitral tribunal in aid of a final arbitral award. And the measures which we're discussing are interim in nature. They are not the final measures or relief that will be ordered by a tribunal, but they're determined either to secure the status quo during the pendency of the dispute or to obtain other evidence or key pieces of uh, documents or material which is relevant to obtaining the tribunal's final order. And so in that context, it is uh, important to remember that there are two ways to obtain interim measures through the international arbitration route. One way is through the arbitration route itself, through either an emergency arbitration procedure or addressing an application directly to the panel which has been constituted. And the second uh, method or route, if you will, is through a court of competent jurisdiction, which has jurisdiction over a party, a key piece of evidence, or a particular asset which may serve as a subject of the dispute. And so today, as we're discussing interim measures, we will be switching between those which are ordered by an arbitral tribunal and those which could be or are ordered by uh, local courts in aid of arbitration but I wanted to make sure that that distinction was clear as we will be moving in and out of the various types of measures. Now, with that said, it is uh, time for me to introduce our distinguished uh, members of the panel. And I'll begin uh, by introducing Carmen Martinez Lopez, who is a partner at Three Crowns in London. He's an advocate in both investment treaty and commercial arbitrations under various institutional rules and under ad hoc arbitral rules. Her most recent key experience includes representing an energy company in an investment dispute against the Republic of Colombia, a consortium of oil and gas companies in a tax stabilization dispute against a Latin American state, an energy company in a shareholders dispute relating to a JV gas marketing company, a mining junior in its investment against the Kingdom of Spain, and a private equity investor in an investment dispute against the Kingdom of Spain. And Carmen's a dual qualified civil and common law trained attorney. 
and she regularly handles contentious work in English, Spanish, and French. She's admitted to the bars in New York and Madrid, in addition to being a solicitor of the senior courts of England and Wales. Carmen holds degrees from Columbia Law School, the College of Europe, and the University of Mercia. She is the president of the British chapter of the Spanish Arbitration Club and a member of the Arbitrator Appointment Committee of the Madrid Arbitration Court. Welcome, Carmen. Next, it's my pleasure to introduce Fernando Eduardo Serec. Fernando is a partner at Tozzini Ferreira in Sao Paulo, Brazil, where he serve, serves as the firm CEO and head of the litigation and arbitration practice groups. Fernando has broad experience in international litigation and arbitration involving real estate, complex financial contracts, and a wide range of administrative law issues. He's worked on arbitrations in Brazil, the US, Europe, and through major international and local institutions involving mergers and acquisitions, joint ventures, financial and banking disputes, infrastructure projects, and insurance and construction contracts. Fernando is consistently recognized and recommended as a leader in the field by a number of international legal publications, including Chambers Global, Chambers Latin America, The Legal 500, The Latin Lawyer 250, IFLR 1000, and the expert guides and who's who legal. Fernando studied at the Academy of American and International Law, organized by the Center for American and International Law in the United States. He holds a master's degree in civil law from the law school of USP, Universidad de Sao Paulo. Fernando holds a number of leadership positions as well in the international arbitration community. He's the president of the AmCham American Chamber of Commerce Arbitration and Mediation Centers uh, advisory Council, a member of the Advisory Council of the Brazil Corporate Arbitration Center, and a member of the Advisory Board of the ITA, the Institute for Transnational Arbitration. Fernando has also authored a large number of uh, scholarly articles and papers and know-how guides, including those from Global Arbitration Review, Chamber Chambers Practice Guides, and International Civil Procedure Handbook, and the Encyclopedia for International Commercial Litigation. Fernando, welcome. Last but not least, and I know we were having some technical difficulties, it's, it will be my pleasure to introduce to you Professor George Berman once we're able to begin with him. So please bear with us. But in the meantime, I think we should start with our first surgical topic, if I may, which relates to the standards by which a tribunal should grant interim uh, relief. Now we know from the various arbitral rules that many of the institutional and ad hoc rules provide the tribunal with the power to order interim relief. But interestingly, most of those rules are silent as to the standards which should be applied. So to begin, may I ask Carmen, what are the standards should, that should apply to an application for interim relief? Well, it, that, that is indeed a very good question because as you say, um, there's a bit of, of lack of um, uh, clarity on, 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 on that answer. I think in my experience, um, arbitral tribunals certainly rarely refer to the legal standards that are established by the law of the seat of the arbitration. They also rarely refer to the law governing the contract. Um, and instead, what they tend to do is refer to the international practice, some kind of you know, transnational standards that have emerged um, from arbitral practice and to the extent that they exist to the applicable arbitration rules. Um, as, as, as you were saying, Brandon, there is not, uh, not many of those rules actually contain um, some standards and those that do so um, are, are also not uh, comprehensive in, in, uh, in establishing those, those standards, but I'll get back to this. I think, you know, from arbitral practice, what is clear these days as, is that there are two top criteria that are used by most of, of the arbitral tribunals, and those are urgency and, and necessity. Uh, that is certainly true in investor state arbitrations. Most of the decisions on interim measures are published. And from looking at those, you know, it is it is clear statistically that those are the uh, top two criteria that are being used by the tribunals. And I think it's probably also true in commercial arbitration, although the, the certain tribunals may put it in in uh, in slightly different way. And so, what do I mean exactly by urgency, and what do I mean by necessity? Well, 
urgency, most tribunals tend to require that provisional measures are urgent in the sense that the question cannot await the outcome of the award on the merits. That, that's the test that most tribunals seem to apply. Now, yet sometimes you'll find some tribunals um, finding that there's no urgency on the basis that the applicant or, or, or the claimant or, or whoever is making the, the application for interim measures was delayed in seeking those interim measures. Uh, now, I personally query whether, whether as a matter of principle that is the correct approach as for me, the test for urgency should clearly be whether or not the uh, question can await to the outcome of the award on the merits. And so consideration as to whether a party was delayed or not may fit better under some other of, of, the, of the criteria, some other of the standards, such as necessity or even proportionality. Uh, but, but that is certainly no doubt a relevant consideration as well. And now turning to necessity, uh, tribunals follow different approaches when it comes to necessity, and particularly when it comes to the to the degree of the risk of harm that justifies granting the provisional measures. Uh, traditionally, the majority of decisions require quote unquote irreparable harm, and again, here the uh, investor state. Uh, arbitrations, which again are, are publicly available, do provide quite a telling indication of how this requirement has evolved over time. Because these days, in more recent cases, most tribunals appear to be lowering a little bit that threshold. And instead of requiring irreparable harm, they tend to require something like substantial harm or serious or grave damage for the requesting party. Um, or a sufficient risk of harm of prejudice. And of course, the 2010 UNCITRAL rules have also helped in this regard because they now refer to harm not adequately reparable by an award on damages. They do no longer refer to quote unquote irreparable harm. And applicants will tell the tribunals that, of course, that wording was deliberately adopted in the UNCITRAL rules as a departure from that irreparable harm standard, which was perceived by the drafters to be setting a bar a little bit too high to the uh, 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 granting of interim measures. Um, now, I, I said those are, I, I, I think, the two key criteria necessity really is the most difficult one to meet out of those two in a way when when you look at urgency uh, as you should um, and it is uh, the ground where most interim relief applications fail there are other criteria that arbitral tribunals tend to consider proportionality for instance um, and and again this is a little bit of a new trend um, I think it's, it's particularly uh, after 2010, or at least, again, that is what the statistics show us in terms of investor state arbitrations, so those who, which are published. But I think uh, that is a statistic that is uh, th that, that probably also applies to commercial arbitration. So since 2010, we're seeing how tribunals seem to start considering proportionality as a separate criterion in, in, in those cases. And what tribunals are doing is waiting the, the effect that granting the provisional measure has on one of the parties versus the risk uh, that they're trying to prevent on the other party. Um, and again, the 2010 UNCITRAL rules do refer to proportionality explicitly as, as, one, of, as one of those criteria, as does Rule 46.3 of the, of the exit rules, which refer to urgency, necessity, and, and proportionality. Now, fourth criteria, prima facie case on the on what well, both on jurisdiction and on the merits. And this, of course, particularly on the merits, is a is a bit of a contentious one because traditionally uh, a prima facie case on the merit was not a criteria that was used in international arbitration. And the principal rationale that was used for excluding this requirement 
was that it, otherwise it would foster the appearance of the arbitrators prejudging the case in some way. I, I think that also has changed in recent years, and I think that change is the product of two things happening. First, what's been happening in commercial cases, where no doubt arbitrators are bringing with them their baggage in terms of what are the requirements for a successful interim application. And in most countries and in most jurisdictions, you know, they would require the applicant to show that they have a prima facie case on the merits. And so I think more and more when seen in commercial cases, how arbitrators are also require are, are also asking for such uh, a showing. T to be clear, that again is only a prima facie showing. It's it's quite easy to <laughs> to meet in a way uh, because because arbitrators continue to be a bit careful uh, not to give the appearance of being prejudging the case. And the other reason why I think in most recent jurisprudence we start seeing these cases again because the language in the UNCITRAL cases, in the UNCITRAL rules, the 2010 UNCITRAL rules, which again make reference to this, um, to these requirements. But, but I think that interestingly, the result is that you see these criteria being applied applied in commercial cases and you see it being applied in UNCITRAL cases, you see much less of it in exit cases with a very low percentage of exit tribunals requiring such a showing uh, 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 to grant provisional measures. Um, my only, my last point, I guess, is, you know, when you're dealing with requests such as security for cost, uh, then all of the standards are, are a bit uh, uh, more complicated to meet uh, because uh, tribunals uh, do tell us that it is only in very extreme cases or circumstances that they would grant this kind of, um, of interim measures. Thank you, Carmen. And I understand now we are joined by Professor uh, Berman, so I'll take this brief opportunity to in introduce him. Uh, professor Berman is a professor at Columbia University Law School and currently the Jean Monnet Professor of European Union Law, the Walter Gelhorn Professor of Law, and at Columbia Law School, Pro uh, Professor Berman teaches international commercial arbitration, international investment law and arbitration, transnational litigation, a practicum in international practice, in a seminar on international arbitration and EU law. Professor Berman is also the director of the Columbia Law School Center for International Commercial Investment Arbitration, a founder and former director of the Columbia Law School University, European Legal Studies Center, excuse me, a professor at the Ecole de Droit Institut de Sciences Politiques in Paris, and a professor at the Geneva LLM in International Dispute uh, Settlement, the MID here, here in Geneva. In addition to his academic pursuits, Professor Berman has an enviable roster of arbitral appointments and acts as counsel in international commercial arbitrations and serves as a legal expert on issues of applicable law. Professor Berman also invests significant time in developing and progressing international arbitration through his positions as chief reporter of the ALI Restatement of the U.S. Law and International Commercial Arbitration, co-director of the Academic Task Force on the Unsuitable Working Group, and uh, yeah, hearing some background and holds a, num a number of positions in major arbitral institutions, including uh, at the ICC and as a member of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, the New York International Arbitration Center, and the American Arbitration Association. So, with that, Professor Berman, it's a pleasure to have you with us. And I'll put you. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. And I'll put you immediately in, in the hot seat, which is we were just discussing with Carmen um, the fact that. Various arbitral rules tell the tribunal that it has powers to order interim measures, but doesn't have uh, a, a standard test to apply. And my question is, is is related, but on a slightly different note, which is most of the arbitral rules allow parties the ability to go to the tribunal or to a court to obtain various interim uh, relief, with the exception now of the latest version of the LCIA rule which require a party to obtain leave from the tribunal before going to a court um, for obtaining interim relief. And my question to you is, what do you make of the fact that the LCIA rules have added this additional requirement that a party needs to seek leave from the arbitral tribunal before it can go to a court to seek interim relief? Thank you, Brendan. Uh, let me tell you, I had very severe 
technological problems. So I'm sorry to have been late, Brendan, but I am here. We're happy to have you. Thank you, thank you. Well, I think this move by the LCIA is a manifestation of a sentiment that I think has been slowly and subtly growing uh, that when courts presume at the request of a party, of course, uh, to issue interim relief in aid of arbitration, that that represents an interference with the arbitral tribunal's prerogatives to control the proceedings. We all know that the parties are the masters of the arbitration, but to the extent that they have not agreed on any given procedure, really the authority lies with the tribunal. Every tribunal that I know of has authority under its rules to offer uh, interim relief and will presumably do so if the tribunal thinks it's warranted. Now, if a party can go to court and get interim relief under circumstances where the tribunal would deny it, uh, that is, I think, it's not necessarily my view, but it is increasingly, I think, the view um, that that represents uh, an interference uh, and that if interim relief is needed from a court, the tribunal can get it. I, I think that in a nutshell is what lies behind the LCIA um, position. Uh, I, I think it may be followed, Brendan. And Fernando, I'd, I'd like to get your opinion on this, this matter as well on sort of two issues that were mentioned by Professor Berman. First is the issue of whether or not a party seeking a court-ordered interim measure for that court is somehow interfering with the tribunal's powers or disposition to settle the dispute. And second, your general experience in terms of court practice in seeking or counseling clients, which route they might want to pursue between a court-ordered interim measure or seeking an interim measure before an arbitral tribunal. And then first of all, uh, I want to thank the invitation in the name of uh, Felipe and Andre. It's a, a great honor to, to share this panel uh, with you, with uh, George and Carmen. Uh, first of all, uh, I agree with uh, everything that Carmen mentioned in the practice in domestic and international cases involving uh, Brazilian companies. Uh, uh, we follow the same standards for an order of interim measures. Uh, I, I think that a, an arbitration, arbitration tribunal is not bound to any specific law, uh, transnational or soft law sources, but uh, at least in Brazil and or in, in arbitrations involving Brazilian bar bodies, the standards for an, an order of interim measures uh, follows in a certain way the same rules adopted for court cases. Uh, irreparable harm uh, if relief is not granted, uh, urgency of a decision, and the likelihood of success of, on the marriages. Regarding seeking uh, interim orders, interim measures uh, from courts or uh, from a tribunal, uh, with the amendment of the Brazilian law, uh, Brazilian Arbitration Act, uh, in 2015, uh, to, there is a specific rule on that, on uh, Article uh, 22, Section 2 and 22A. Before arbitration proceedings have been initiated, courts can grant any types of interim measures seeking to preserve parties' rights. After the proceedings uh, have been initiated, state courts can intervene in, in very specific situations such as on the subpoena of a witness and fails to appear to court. Uh, in my practice, uh, we, we follow absolutely this rule. Rel rarely we, we seek an injunction uh, from uh, an, an emergency uh, arbitrator. Uh, I have tried that in, in some cases, uh, in cases uh, under ICC rules and even uh, under uh, a Brazilian uh, institution. Uh, my experience was not uh, that good in seeking injunctions in, in such a fashion. So uh, uh, 
uh, my preference is to go to courts whenever it's uh, mandatory before the procedures uh, and of course seek confirmation afterwards from the from the tribunals from the arbitration tribunals thank you i saw carmen uh, looked like she might have a, a comment carmen the, the, you're on mute. oh Sorry. So I, I just wanted to react to the point that uh, George was making about the um, amendment to the LCIA rules and, you know, no, absolutely no disagreement with what George was saying. Just give a little bit of context there as to what m might be happening there. Um, just to recall, you know, Section 44.3 of the English Arbitration Act um, says that in cases of urgency, uh, the, an English court may make um, orders that it thinks are necessary to uh, preserve evidence or assets, for instance. But then section 44.5 says that the court may only act to the extent that the arbitral tribunal has no power or is unable for the time being to act. And uh, you, you will recall a, a number of years ago in 2016, in Gerald Meadows versus Timis, uh, what happened was that the applicant sought a freezing order from English courts. And the court said that they did not have the power to grant that freezing order because the applicant request uh, for an emergency arbitrator under the LCIA rules had already been considered and it had been dismissed by the um, LCIA. And, and so as a result, the High Court basically concluded that a timely and effective relief could have been granted by the expedited tribunal or by the emergency arbitrator under the LCR rule, and that was a, the, the reason for the court not to grant it. And I think a lot of that background is what's behind that LCIA amendment, whether, whether the way in which this amendment deals with this is, is the appropriate one or not, is, is a bit of a different story, and we'll see what happens from now on. Thank, thank you, Carmen. I think that was a, a very helpful clarification, and I think it's um, a good lead-in uh, to our next surgical topic, if I may, which relates to the efficacy of tribunal-ordered interim measures. So simply as a very brief background, typically when a party is considering making the interim application, it has to reckon with the fact that potentially the outcome of the application is in the form of a procedural order from the arbitral tribunal, which may or may not be uh, enforceable or directly enforceable in the various jurisdictions where the party is trying to obtain some form of relief. And so there are certainly discussions about what is and what ought to be done by local courts when it comes to enforcing or dealing with a procedural order in respect of an interim application that's been made. So with that very brief introduction, I'll first uh, turn the floor over to Fernando and ask what, what is to be made of that dichotomy. Great, Brendan. Uh, the approach taken by domestic courts to this question has, the, as, as you know, varied across jurisdiction. Uh, some courts have found that uh, where arbitrator uh, interim measures finally dispose of certain issues, they are enforceable as a court decision. That's uh, the practice in Brazil, uh, and I will speak uh, about this this uh, this environment, uh, which is my practice. Brazil is a friendly jurisdiction regarding enforceability of interim measures granted by uh, arbitration tribunals. Uh, the new cases in the country. And uh, this new civil procedure code has established several uh, forms of aid of courts uh, to uh, arbitration procedures, uh, including specific rules dealing with provisional remedies and interim reliefs. Uh, implementation of uh, what the law said, uh, arbitration letter, which is a legal instrument of cooperation between uh, the tribunal and courts. Uh, it's a, a mechanism that formalizes the dialogue between tribunals and national courts. Uh, 
so uh, for example the national court is empowered to order the bank uh, to freeze the uh, the bank account of a party to the arbitration or to compel a witness to be present in arbitration hearing uh, based on a uh, 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 this type of uh, document issued uh, by uh, a tribunal to the court. Uh, in some states, there are specialized courts that deal with uh, arbitration-related cases, like Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro. Uh, foreign arbitration interim measures can be enforced in Brazil, uh, but uh, the procedure is a little bit uh, cumbersome. They should be subject to uh, an homologation process at the Superior Court of Justice, the same manner as a final arbitration award. And after uh, the uh, homologation, the, the uh, recognition of uh, the uh, interim measure decision, uh, the decision can be enforced uh, by a federal court in Brazil. Uh, federal court will then be able to order the fulfillment of uh, uh, the award uh, or the actions necessary to enforce the foreign judgment, such as seizure and, or, and freezing of bank accounts, seizure of assets and their subsequent sale at auctions, uh, the seizure of credit rights, uh, any other measures that are legally deemed to be necessary for the enforcement. I want to mention one uh, interesting case that uh, uh, was decided uh, in August uh, 2019 by the Superior Court uh, of Justice. Uh, following the trend of international cases, the great majority of orders, uh, as you know, uh, are, are respected by the parties in an arbitration. Uh, but uh, the tribunal should always have in mind uh, the enforceability of uh, its order. In this case, it was fun. It was interesting because uh, uh, the judge, uh, the the court, uh, went a little bit further. Uh, it was a case involving uh, a company named Impabra, mining company Pau Brasil S.A., and two individuals, Juarez de, Juarez de Oliveira Rabelo and other. The case is a special appeal number uh, 1798089 from the state of Minas Gerais. Uh, the, the tribunal issued an order. It was a dispute over mining rights. Uh, the, the tribunal, the arbitration tribunal issued an order. Uh, and the order uh, was not uh, fulfilled by, by the parties. Uh, the, the judge imposed uh, a fine and increased the fine uh, and the, the decision was not uh, respected by, by the parties. Then the judge demanded a third party company that has contractual and corporate liations with the party in the arbitration to provide information regarding quantities of ore produced by the mine. And uh, this company, uh, who presented a, a, a motion uh, establishing that uh, uh, it was not bound to, to the arbitration and uh, it was not bound to the uh, arbitration order. And uh, more than that, that the judge uh, has uh, in fact uh, exceeding his powers because he uh, even amended the, or it's, it was not an amendment, but he directed the order to this third party. Uh, the, the Superior Court of Justice, uh, it's, it's a case that was uh, first decided by uh, Ministra Nancy Andrighi, Justice Nancy Andrighi, mentions that the harmonious co coexistence of the two jurisdictions, arbitration and state, is allowed as long as the corresponding competences are respected, which have an absolute nature. Uh, the determination of compliance with arbitration letters by the judiciary is not a purely mechanical activity. Uh, as restricted as it might, may be, the judiciary has a limited margin of interpretation to enforce decisions uh, legally enforced by uh, arbitration courts. And uh, another comment from the decision, uh, therefore it is acceptable to live with arbitration and judicial decisions 
when they do not contradict each other and have the purpose of preserving the effectiveness the, the effectiveness of future uh, arbitration decisions it's a it's a, a case that uh, may be common uh, excess of power from from the judge and that has no jurisdiction this matter of a 30 party but uh it seems to be a a a, a very good decision uh in practice uh those are my comments uh, Fernando, thank you. If I may, um, Professor Berman, do you have um, a view on, on two issues? One, the enforceability of a tribunal order in the US, and two, what, what are we to make of this general notion that a, that a procedural order is, is generally less enforceable than, than Thank you. A, thank you, Brendan. Uh, yes, sort of background in a way to what Fernando had to say, there really is a prior question before we get to the modalities of, of enforcement uh, as to whether procedural orders are capable, uh, legally capable of, of being enforced. Uh, and though uh, in a way it's a bit anti-arbitration, although that's a dangerous term, although it's a bit of uh, anti-arbitration to leave procedural orders unenforceable, the prevailing view around the world, but not uniformly, is that by definition, they are non-final. By definition, they're provisional. And they do not therefore qualify um, as awards for purposes of even under the New York Convention. Uh, now, um, that is, um, has, its, has its disadvantages. Uh, to, uh, to some extent, <laughs> to some extent, it's, if you pardon the term, pro-arbitration, keep the courts out of it, but it's anti-arbitration to see to it that provisional measures remain unenforceable. Uh, it's a good example, Brendan, for me, of how the terms anti-arbitration and pro-arbitration can be somewhat misleading, because I think we could come up with a rationale that it's both pro and anti in this particular case. Now, there are jurisdictions, the US is one of them, that is prepared to treat interim measures as awards for all purposes. So they are enforceable as awards. In a sense, they are assimilated to partial awards. I'm assuming they are not partial awards, but they're assimilated to them, if you will, um, and therefore enforceable. But in most jurisdictions, it isn't. To my understanding, and I may be wrong, Singapore has actually um, amended its law to specifically make them enforceable. And I'll only add, Brendan, because I don't want to take up too much time, but you and I have discussed the UNCTRAL model law, which I think is really interesting in this regard. The drafters of the UNCTRAL model law didn't want to take that step to make a non-final determination, a final determination. It didn't want to do that but it wanted interim measures to be enforceable. So uh, in a sense, um, it invented something. Um, it invented something, gave it a new name, preliminary order, and that is enforceable without being an award, without being an award. So it's non-final, but enforceable. Only add here, Brendan, we're focusing on enforcement. But a really interesting question that's very undecided is what about annulment? Parties that have catastrophic interim relief measures rendered against them do not <laughs> want to be able to challenge them. Uh, and if they're not awards, they cannot, they cannot be challenged under many, under most, um, under most arbitration laws. Uh, the unsuitable model law is silent. It, it's silent on annulment, but it's clear on enforcement. I, I, I hope that's adequate, Brendan. No, it, it's, it's more than adequate, but Professor Berman, I have one um, uh, short follow-up question, which is if the US courts are prepared to treat procedural orders something like partial awards, in resisting uh, an enforcement, enforcement of that partial award, 
Uh, are the U.S. courts open to looking at the various grounds for annulment under the FAA or, or something similar? Or are we defending on a different basis? Yeah. First of all, I don't want to use the, procedure, the term procedural order here because I'm drawing a distinction between preliminary measures and procedural orders. I think our working hypothesis is that something that is genuinely a procedural order um, is not capable of legal enforcement. So when I'm speaking, Brendan, I, I'm referring now to interim measures mm -hmm. as opposed to ordinary garden variety procedural orders. Now, US courts are enforcing them, as I said. Uh, there's very little case law, and I had to examine this for the restatement, on whether they can be challenged legally. I'm surprised there isn't more. Um, I would be tempted to seek annulment of an interim measure that the other party has the right to enforce. We're not, we're not really accustomed, are we, Brendan, to a party being able to enforce an order without another party able, the other party able to have a converse remedy. Um, but I think that is sort of where we are. Uh, and I think it's a little bit peculiar. Anyway, I did want to underscore in my mind the difference between a procedural order and a preliminary uh, ruling on, on interim relief. I will admit, Brendan, that the line isn't altogether clear. If I could now, thank you, Professor Berman. If I could now um, ask Carmen to, to make uh, a comment on any differences in respect of uh, exit or investment arbitration practice in this area. Thank you, Brendan. Uh, I, I think there is one point um, that, that's interesting enough to bring to this discussion when it comes to um, uh, particularly exit uh, interim measure decisions, where, and that goes to the binding nature of those. So it's a, it's a bit of a related point to the, a, a bit of a different yet related point to the point of enforcement, but, but it's a key one because let's not lose sight of the fact that most uh, in most instances, interim relief uh, decisions are complied by voluntarily. Uh, and, and, and so, you know, the binding nature of those orders in a lot of instances is enough to ensure compliance. We don't need to go to the enforcement of those uh, because they are voluntarily complied. Now, in that context, there is the lasting debate in the exit um, context as to uh, the recommendations issued by exit tribunal do or do not have that binding effect. You would recall that the exit rules, as opposed to, for instance, the UNCITRAL rules, uh, which refer to the tribunal being able to issue orders on interim relief, simply refers, exit rules simply refers to uh, the tribunal issuing recommendations. And that language has been seized by uh, generally respondent states, uh, because they tend to be the ones defending against those interim um, relief applications as well, to argue that they are not binding. Um, I think the case law is clear enough uh, as of today to um, disprove that contention. I think the case law is clear that uh, exit recommendations uh, on, on interim relief are binding. But you still have and uh, some uh, um, particularly respondents again because of the nature of the exercise who are making this argument and I and I'll, I'll refer to the recent well not so recent anymore but uh, to the Perenco interim measures uh, application. Um, that was granted by the tribunal a few years ago in its investment dispute against Ecuador. And uh, you will recall Ecuador actually refused to comply with uh, that interim measure applica uh, decision, arguing that it was merely a recommendation and therefore it was, it was not binding on it. Um, of course, there's a question as to whether strategically that is wise because you have an arbitral tribunal who's gonna rule on the merits of your dispute and who has issued some provisional measure uh, decision that you're not complying with, but th th there are many reasons by why uh, uh, one of the parties may, may, be de may, may decide to do that. And of course, there are some things that the tribunal can do about it, including in its final award, finding that that party, by not complying with 
the interim measure decision that was issued by the tribunal either breached the contract or breached some other kind of obligation, um, in, including, you know, if, if we're talking about interim relief that relates to the presentation of documents or, or the like, uh, drawing adverse inference, uh, cost orders, um, et cetera, et cetera. Jump in here, just going back for a moment to court ordered measures um, and picking up on Carmen's discussion of ICSID. Um, I wanna mention something that isn't known because it's in the ICSID rules rather than the convention itself, is that um, access to a court for interim relief in ICSID proceedings is off limits unless the parties have agreed in advance. And that's viewed as important to the so-called self-contained uh, nature of ICSID proceedings. Uh, so the parties uh, would need in advance to say, we agree that a party has access to a court. That's unusual. Indeed. Uh, and, I and if I may, please, please. No, no, and if I may, just following up on George's point, if I may, it is actually in my experience, um, one very relevant consideration why uh, claimants decide to pursue maybe uncitral arbitration mm -hmm. versus exit arbitration, uh, because it is an important consideration for yeah. some for some claimants. Yeah, I mean, some parties don't like, uh, don't anticipate liking this self-contained thing, <laughs> you know. Uh, the self-contained thing is really uh, very nice from many, many, many points of view. But if you know in advance that you don't want a self-contained arbitration because you're gonna need the assistance of a court, ICSID isn't, as attractive. I think that's your point, Carmen. Very good. What I would ask, and Carmen, I hate to jump right back to you, but first is, is to discuss what would be our next topic, which is this issue of worldwide uh, freezing orders. And, and my understanding though, subject to your correction, of course, is that these freezing orders are meant to um, preserve or stop any dissipation of assets, either uh, for the purpose of security for costs or security for the ultimate recovery of the claim. And I think there are a number of questions which we'll deal with, but could I first have your introduction into these worldwide freezing orders in terms of assets? Because it's something I think that varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, though we're certainly more familiar with it coming from the UK and the UK court practice. Yes, Brendan, you're you're absolutely right. This is one of the of the key features of the uh, um, of the English court system. It's not only in the UK, but um, the UK are are is relatively generous with 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 granting this worldwide freezing injunctions and and in fact this is often cited as one of the reasons why parties may want to choose London as a seat of the arbitration. We'll see that actually you can get one of these worldwide freezing orders even from English courts even if your arbitration is not seated in England, but uh, certainly having your arbitration seated in, in England uh, helps to, uh, to meet the relevant test. And, and we'll see that in a second. But as you very well described, right, that uh, freezing orders, also called Mariva injunctions, they're, they're an interim injunctions that basically prevents a party from disposing of uh, assets, and, and that's to ensure that the assets in question remain available until an arbitral award or, or a court judgment, but we're focusing on the arbitral award here, uh, judgment can, can, be, uh, can be enforced. And they are a remedy typically sought of courts, not of arbitral tribunals. And of course, there's a reason for that because they at times require extraterritorial enforcement. And, and we of course know that that's something where the courts are much better at. And they also sometimes require the adjudication of rights of third parties. And again, that, that's something uh, where the courts are gonna be much, much better placed. Um, so what are the key considerations that, you know, a party wanting to seek one of these worldwide 
uh, uh, freezing order should should keep in mind. Well, first, do you meet the criteria? And the criteria are, are relatively simple in a way. You know, is the good arguable case test? Is the re real risk of dissipation test? And is the the just and convenient test? Um, and and so, good arguable good arguable case test is pretty easy to understand what I'm talking about. Do you have a good prima facie case on the merits? Again, the, um, the examination here is pure prima facie. Uh, real risk of dissipation test outside of what is the ordinary course of business. It's actually not necessary to show that a defendant is likely to dissipate its, its assets. You don't need to show that he's likely to, or that he has the intention to do that. So again, not a particularly difficult test to meet in a way. Um, just and convenient test, this is uh, uh, just a, a, a bit of a, a, a caution for the, for the courts uh, to decide whether this makes indeed sense or not. Um, and then what courts are requiring is that there's a sufficient connection to the assets or to the party to England. Um, and so there's no need for the arbitration to be seated in England, but there is a need to have, if the arbitration is not seated in English, you would have to show uh, a certain connection to, to England. And in this respect, the Mobile Ferro versus uh, uh, Pedevesa uh, case from a few years ago is particularly instructive. In that case, the court found that there was no sufficient link with England because there was no business operations in England. There was no office that was set in England. There were no bank accounts. There were no assets in the jurisdiction. Um, and, and so that wasn't enough for the English courts to issue this kind of worldwide um, freezing order injunctions. Nationality also importantly by itself and alone doesn't seem to be enough. You, you do need that kind of long-term connection with, with the jurisdiction, whether that's by, by reference to residency, domicile conduct or, or something else. Um, the, the important to keep in mind that the applicant will be required to give a cross undertaking in damages uh, to make good any losses suffered by the respondent if the injunction ultimately proved wrongly granted. And this is actually comes to, to the surprise of uh, certain applicants who are very willing and very interested in filing one of these uh, Mareva injunctions until they learn that indeed they do are required to give this kind of cross undertaking and then, and then uh, suddenly it's not uh, so such an attractive proposition anymore. Um, another practical point to keep in mind, the application will generally be made ex parte. Um, and, and that, of course, is, is it can be strategically very interesting. But you also need to keep in mind that that imposes on the applicant a duty of full and frank disclosure of all material facts, also of those material facts that do not benefit the applicant. And so that's something to keep very much in mind, because if the applicant doesn't comply with this legal duty, then the freezing order may be set aside just on that basis, just on the basis that the applicant didn't comply with the duty to, to offer uh, full and frank disclosure, and there may be uh, cost sanctions implications as well. Um, I, I think I'll leave it here, uh, Brandon, in, in the interest of time. It's, it's a fascinating topic. <laughs> it is fascinating. And what I would like to do, if I could, is, is get the, the view from Brazil and, and the US on the notion of this uh, idea one can attain an ex parte worldwide uh, freezing order in, in aid of an arbitration. Uh, maybe I'll start with, with Fernando if I could. Uh, the, the most difficult part, uh, uh, of course, it, it is possible for, uh, for, Brazil, for a, a, a tribunal to reach an order like that and to enforce this decision in, in Brazil, which it, I think that it's, it's uh, uh, the interest here, uh, as I mentioned, a foreign decision, uh, even an interim measure decision, award or a procedural order. Uh, uh, I like uh, comments of uh, George on that. Uh, I had a case, uh, an ICC case, in which I was an arbitrator, and uh, we issued a procedural order for interim measures, and ICC demanded us to, to change it for uh, uh, 
a partial award. Uh, and we did that, of course, but uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, this doubt uh, remains here in Brazil. What is the mechanism, what is the format of a, a procedural, uh, of a, a interim measure, procedural order or, uh, or an award? Uh, the difficult part is the, the enforcement because uh, as if we have like a, a, a decision from New York or a decision from uh, London, from a, a, a tribunal, to be enforced in Brazil, we need to, to pass through the homologation process as the Superior Court of Justice. Uh, there are at least theoretically a way to request an injunction to the Superior Court of Justice. Uh, while the homologation process is pending. So there is a possibility uh, by which uh, you can expedite proceedings requesting an injunction uh, from a justice of the Superior Court of Justice. Another interesting point is uh, the one uh, raised by Carmen regarding uh, bonds uh, in order to, to assure uh, damages or cross undertakings, uh, which is not a, uncommon in Brazil. Uh, I was thinking here about a situation in which uh, the Civil Procedure Code establishes that whenever uh, uh, an injunction or uh, interim measure is ordered by a court, if this order causes uh, damages to a party and at the end of the, the procedure, uh, the decision, the injunction, or the interim measure is reversed. Uh, the party is obliged to to, uh, to to indemnify the damages. I was imagining uh, the situation in a Brazilian uh, arbitration case, in which there is this provision of the civil procedure code. In, in principle, is not applicable to the arbitration itself. Uh, so uh, once an interim measure is requested, I think that a party that is uh, subject to this uh, interim measure should uh, uh, demand the arbitrators uh, to to uh, to issue a damage uh, relief at the end of the case uh, in case of reversion of uh, of the decision. Thank you, Fernando. Uh, Professor Berman, any any reactions? I think you're well. Uh, in in this particular uh, in this particular case, uh, the Moreva injunction is really front and center when it comes to the United States, because back in 1999, uh, the Supreme Court was called upon to effectively decide whether we were going to embrace the Moreva injunction. Uh, or we weren't. Um, and the Moreva injunction, Carmen, as you probably know, uh, and the success of it uh, was, it was um, relied upon greatly uh, in aid of the position that it should be available under, under US law as well. But an extremely controversial decision uh, with um, five to four, uh, as usual. Uh, in, the, in that uh, decision, uh, Justice Scalia, who is an originalist, as we know, um, ruled that uh, this was unavailable because it was an equitable remedy, not a legal remedy. And at the time uh, that we in the United States um, enacted the Judiciary Act, um, it wasn't available in England, and therefore it wasn't available in the United States, and therefore it's simply unavailable. I will say that that elicited a very powerful dissent from the late Justice Ginsburg. Who, who said, essentially, you have no business freezing equity. Equity should not be frozen uh, in 1789. It has evolved, um, if you will. Um, I just want to add strategically, Brendan, that the door is open for a Mareva injunction under very particular circumstances that parties have taken advantage of. First of all, it's available if you have a legally cognizable interest in that property. The, the property that is to be frozen, if you can claim um, a property interest in it, then it's okay. 
if you already have a judgment, it's okay. And finally, and to my not full understanding, um, the court has also held that if what you're seeking in the main proceeding is an equitable remedy, like rescission or an accounting or restitution, if what you're seeking is not damages, but what you're seeking is an equitable remedy, then you can. Uh, let me just close by saying uh, parties are now pretty much invariably adding equitable claims, eh, adding equitable claims to their legal claims, uh, even though they're not looking for equity, they're looking for damages. Uh, and that clears the way to a Mareva injunction. But I find it really interesting. This is one of those cases where a powerful institution under English law is brought before the Supreme Court and, and radically rejected, um, not on policy grounds. I think that's fascinating. Not on policy grounds, but on some sort of originalist uh, grounds. And therefore, um, the ball is in the legislature's court to expressly authorize this. And in many states, that's been done. I hope that's responsive, Brendan. That is very, very interesting indeed. Um, Carmen, yes, please. Those very interesting remarks. My prediction, Professor Berman, and and uh, and uh, I'll be interested in hearing yours. But my prediction is the legislator will do something about this because I don't think the l'air du temps, as the French would say, it goes against Mareva injunctions. And, and in fact, you know, when you follow what's happening recently in the UK, you see that after the Mobile Cerro case that I mentioned, you know, you've got more recent cases, ArcelorMittal versus Cesar Still Limited, for instance, which is a 2019 case where the commercial case, court actually granted a worldwide freezing order uh, in aid of, of uh, 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 an arbitration. Um, Although the, the, we were talking about foreign proceedings, uh, foreign disputing parties, no significant assets within the jurisdiction, right? And and so, of course, the other party was saying, well, you English court should not, and I'm quoting, should not become an international policeman. And the English court actually said, well, that, that's actually not right. <laughs> you know, that there is a solid risk of dissipation of the assets in this case. It's just, just inconvenient to grant a worldwide freezing order despite the absence of uh, factors connecting the case to England, and 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 you know the case was a little bit particular because it it, it was a case where the court said, well, you know, it's it, we're talking about international fraud, and therefore English courts are or should be more willing to intervene. But still, I think it shows that you know Mariva injunctions are not going anywhere, and the trend worldwide is going to be a little bit towards the English position as opposed to you know what what Mr. Scalia told us um, <laughs> on, on, on I, I, Carmen, I fully agree with you. And um, the, the case I'm talking about um, is Grupo Mexicano um, is the name of the case. It has very few fans. I mean, it is about, it is one of the most keenly criticized um, opinions out there. Um, now, instead of enacting measures uh, that will authorize it, what we simply see is a, a very strategic and astute lawyers circumventing it. But that's a typical American response, right? Uh, you know, don't don't uh, don't actually go to the legislature. Just use some um, council ingenuity. Uh, and so, if we are so successful, Carmen, if our our bar is so successful in circumventing um, Grupo Mexicano, that will probably reduce the urgency. <laughs> of having a legislative intervention. Point taken, point taken. <laughs> <laughs> One might be more efficient than the other without <laughs> <laughs> otherwise. To stay on a, a somewhat controversial topic but change gears just a little bit, I would like to ask the, the panel's views on something that I've been hearing more about recently, uh, which is this idea of a tribunal-ordered anti-suit injunction to prevent 
presumably the parties in front of it, from seeking to litigate the case elsewhere. My first question to all of you, and I'm happy for whoever wishes to address it first to raise their hand, is what are the legal bases for, for a tribunal-ordered anti-suit injunction? I saw Fernando's hand first, so I'll give him the floor. Right, Brandon, thank you. Uh, in Brazil, the, the the legal basis for seeking uh, this type of uh, uh, decision from a tribunal, an arbitration tribunal, is Article 8, uh, the sole paragraph that establishes that the arbitrator has jurisdiction to decide ex officio or at the party's request the issues concerning the existence, validity, and effectiveness of the arbitration agreement, as well as the contract containing the arbitration clause. So, uh, my view, that's, that's the legal basis for this type of uh, uh, anti-suit injunction issued by an uh, arbitration tribunal. Uh, the Brazilian Superior Court of Justice, uh, which is the, the uh, higher court's uh, court on, on matters related to the arbitration law, uh, has issued consistent decisions supporting the competence-competence principle. Uh, but I want you to mention one recent decision in which uh, it seems that uh, the Superior Court of Justice, uh, in my opinion, uh, made a, a, a wrong decision. Uh, the case is a conflict of uh, competence uh, from uh, number 151130, uh, in which the Brazilian Superior Court of, uh, Court of Justice ruled that an uh, a tribunal does not have jurisdiction to decide a claim for damages filed by Petrobras shareholders against the Brazilian Federal Union. Uh, as uh, you, you know, the Petrobras is a, a mixed capital uh, a company controlled by the, the Federal Union in Brazil. Uh, and uh, there are some uh, shareholders and there are some other uh, cases, arbitration cases, uh, against the Federal Union based on the bylaws of Petrobras that establishes uh, arbitration means of a self dispute among uh, the, the shareholders uh, and the company and the shareholders. And according to the court, the arbitration clause contained in Petrobras by law only encompasses corporate disputes between the company and its shareholders and not among uh, the shareholders. In, in this situation, the other shareholders were uh, claiming abuse of uh, control from the Federal Union. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, uh, it's a surprise for, the, at least uh, from uh, part of the Brazilian uh, arbitration community, uh, the decision, uh, because the so-called competence, competence principle provided uh, for in uh, Article 8, so paragra paragraph, was uh, really established uh, uh, as, uh, as uh, was, was confirmed in several other decisions of the Superior Court uh, of Justice, and uh, in in this uh, in this case, uh, it seems that a new orientation is suggested, in the sense that only the discussions regarding the validity and effectiveness of the arbitration clause would be subject to the first judgment in arbitration. Uh, therefore, the challenges related to the existence of the arbitration clause would become the contents of uh, the courts. Uh, I really disagree on the decision, not only uh, uh, regarding uh, arbitration principles and everything, but also the the main core or the core of the decision that establishes that uh, the the arbitration clause in the the bylaws of Petrobras uh, could not uh, encompass uh, uh, a dispute between a controlling shareholder and the other uh, shareholders. Yes, please, Professor Brown. Thank you. Uh, you know, uh, I have to come back to Carmen because we can thank, we can thank the United Kingdom for anti-suit injunctions uh, also. Uh, so uh, 
we've 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 uh, in the U.S. we've picked that up with relish, um, and enforce uh, order anti-suit injunctions regularly. Let me just say at the outset something I find very interesting is that even arbitrators with whom I said who come from jurisdictions in which anti-suit injunctions are 100% off the table as in violation of international comity seem to have no particular problem um, when they sit as arbitrators joining common law arbitrators in issuing uh, anti-suit injunctions. It's growing in popularity. At one time, not that long ago, there was question as to whether arbitrators even had that authority. I honestly think that is not in doubt. And the deb debate now is not on the question of authority, but on the exercise of discretion. Do you or do you not um, order it? Um, I can't resist giving you, because I don't like to talk about our cases, but um, in a case in which I'm sitting, we have a court that is enjoining, um, enjoining the arbitration. And the tribunal is seriously thinking of issuing an anti-suit injunction uh, to uh, prevent the court of the seat from enjoining the injunction. Of course, that what that represents is the proverbial anti-anti-suit injunction, which we have to acknowledge exists. So the tribunal is contemplating trying to forbid a court from seeking to forbid uh, an arbitration. Uh, I can tell you this, uh, uh, this tribunal is unlikely to do that uh, because the court that um, is, is issuing that order or will issue that order is a court of the seat. Uh, you issue an anti-suit injunction to a court of the seat, you're asking for annulment. Uh, you're, you're asking for annulment of your award. Um, just one final word. Um, the issue did come up in the European Court of Justice. And the European Court of Justice, very interestingly, um, ruled that anti-suit injunctions are, are um, objectionable when issued by courts but not objectionable when issued by arbitral tribunals because courts have to show respect for other courts. And I guess tribunals don't have to, but that's an interesting distinction. That's the Gazprom case. Very interesting. Carmen, please, yes. Um, so, so uh, I, I, again, in agreement with all of this, just perhaps to give some statistics, because I think the the, the shift, uh, you know, in in how we perceive the power of of the arbitrators to grant anti suit injunctions has been uh, tremendous and cannot be un understated. You know, um, in fact, as of today, this is one of the most requested interim measures, at least in the investor state world, which is, of course, where we have most of the of the published statistics. But when you look at the 2019 empirical study that was um, that was carried out by the British Institute of International and Comparative Law and, and by White and Case, it's actually the second most requested type of provisional measures with a over 30% of the interim relief requests were, were uh, requests that to stay parallel proceedings in, in the respondent's court. Um, and it's also one of the most frequently granted interim measures. And again, a request for the tribunal to order the stay of, of related court proceedings in the host states have succeeded totally or partially in approximately, and, and the statistic is, is really quite surprising, in approximately 75% of the cases. And, and again, I'm going by this 2019 numbers that, that, that have been published in this empirical study. But you would agree with me that we're, we're far from those days, you know, from that old view that the tribunals did not have the power to issue anti suit injunctions. Example, I think, illustrates it. Um, the more it's used and the more it's successful, and you're entirely right, it's escalated enormously. Um, the reaction of the courts <laughs> uh, you know, it's one thing for the tribunal to order it. Uh, courts may not like being joined, um, and they have devices at their disposal. So I actually think we're contemplating something along the lines of a potential battle or, or conflict uh, between courts and tribunals. I don't know if, Carmen, you're experiencing that as well, but I bet you are. 
So a, a very interesting point, uh, Professor Berman. Now in that in that uh, fight, I think uh, tribunals are are winning as it is. Um, and and for instance, um, in Hydra and others versus Albania, I think uh, offer some interesting insights, at least as to the reaction of the of the English courts. Uh, and again, you you can thank me for this, uh, <laughs> Professor Berman. But you know, uh, th this is again an exit case, and and. Albania had commenced criminal proceedings against three of the claimants, which were Italians. And as a result of those uh, criminal proceedings, um, they had uh, uh, some extradition proceeding had been commenced in the UK to extradite these claimants to Albania. And claimant filed a request for interim measures with the arbitral tribunal, asking that the tribunal, among others, suspended the extradition proceedings. The tribunal agreed. And Albania at first refused to comply with the tribunal's um, decision. Uh, but then a UK magistrate court found that in light of the tribunal's interim relief decision, the extradition proceedings could not go forward. And Albania then dropped its extradition request from the UK courts as a result. So um, I, I think it's, it's an interesting case. As, as Professor Berman says, let's watch this space because um, th there may be more to come. I can't help adding that in that case you're discussing, I had an expert opinion to, to uh, introduce in that very, very, very interesting case. Um, but that's just a comment, throwaway comment. Before we move to our last topic, could I ask uh, Professor Berman, Carmen, Fernando, in the context of a, of a commercial arbitration, would you expect a, a partial award on jurisdiction to be sort of a prerequisite before obtaining an anti-suit uh, injunction when the suit is uh, the same subject matter as the arbitration? Because presumably at least one of the parties would be challenging the, the tribunal's jurisdiction while pursuing uh, a court process somewhere else. We don't think that will make a difference. Um, I think that tribunals are, as, as Carmen says, that tribunals are, are very serious about exercising um, their authority. And if they see a judicial proceeding as a threat to it, I see more and more they're taking action, uh, even at the very outset. I agree. I think that would simply look at whether prima facie they have jurisdiction, and if they find that that is the case, they'll be comfortable enough to issue that kind of relief with, without having already determined, as a matter of fact, that they do indeed have jurisdiction. Yeah. Very interesting. <laughs> Fernando, a last word, or we, we move to... No, no, no. I think that we can move because uh, I agree with both of them. In, in, in fact, uh, I, I see a tendency in Brazil for the the tribunals, uh, let's say, not not to mess with the uh, with the courts uh, uh, in, in uh, almost all the situations. But there are some uh, in which uh, the an anti suit measure uh, is necessary. Uh, so I agree with both of them. Great. And the, the last topic we have up is one uh, which, again, we hear a lot about in terms of generality, but not so much the, the specifics, and which is this uh, petition for various disclosure or discovery in the U.S. under uh, the U.S. Code uh, Section 28, uh, 1782. And so if I could, I'd ask Professor Berman first to give us just a, a brief introduction as to the the nature of, of such a petition and then we'll open it up to, to the panel on, on views of this tool. Sure and one of the things I'd like to hear my colleagues on when I get done is whether just really how unique is the United States um, uh, in this regard. Are any other countries in the world making their courts uh, as readily available as we are? Um, but the question that Brendan is raising um, is a, a very controversial issue. There is a statute in the United States that's not at all recent, but has been amended over the years. That provides uh, that a US court may, upon the request of any interested party, order the production of evidence, including testimony, from any person in that court's jurisdiction in aid of proceedings in a foreign or international tribunal. 
28 U.S. Code 1782 essentially says that. Our courts are available for discovery purposes on a discretionary basis, of course, uh, in aid not only of their own proceedings, but in aid of proceedings in foreign and international tribunals. Uh, I will say this, um, parties in arbitration are becoming more and more familiar with 1782, and they're more and more assertive in seeking evidence in the United States. I don't have time to discuss what lies behind the enactment of 1782. Why are we making unilaterally without reciprocity? Think of it, without any reciprocity requirement, we're making our courts available for evidence gathering, for use overseas. I find that interesting in itself. I'll simply say, I think that statute would not be adopted today. I think the mood of Congress is a little less international, um, to put it mildly. Uh, but it is on the books. Now, the question has arisen time and again, whether arbitral tribunals constitute international courts or tribunals within the meaning of section 1782. On this question, and I'm gonna accelerate this, Brendan. On this question, we have a radical split among our circuits. Uh, and we have recent decisions in the last year or two that highlight that circuit split. Everybody is predicting that the Supreme Court cannot put this off any longer. Uh, we, we simply can't do that. I have to tell you, there is a case, the Servitronics case, um, in which the Seventh Circuit ruled that 1782 is unavailable for arbitral proceedings. And in the same case, Servitronics, the Fourth Circuit said it was. So the Fourth Circuit made evidence available for use in an arbitral uh, uh, proceeding in the same case in which the Seventh Circuit said no, no authority to do so. I mean, it isn't often that you find, is it, Brendan, that you find circuit conflicts in a single case, uh, but, but circuit conflicts in the single case. Just a word about the reasoning. The reasoning is that while, uh, the reasoning of the court saying no, is that while international arbitral tribunals by any everyday understanding are international tribunals, that in, in reality, all that was contemplated were courts and tribunals organized under the auspices of states, public tribunals. Uh, I'm not sure why that's exactly so. I'm not, I'm not in favor of that. The restatement is not in favor of that. I think international arbitral tribunals are international tribunals. I, I, I don't see much argument there. Uh, having said that, investor state tribunals are on the other side of the line because they are regarded uh, as the products of, of states, that states have created those tribunals and therefore they are public and commercial arbitration is completely different. And you, you all remember uh, the Chevron Ecuador case in which, um, in which Chevron got such incredible incriminating information about the Ecuadorian legal system and got it entirely because of what 1782 um, allowed it to get. Uh, I think I should probably leave it there, Brendan, but you can imagine how much more there is to be said. Um, said about this. Uh, I'll leave it there. You may want to come back on a more narrow question. I think that's great. And you might have missed my introduction, but I already assured the audience that even though we could have spent eight hours discussing the various intro measures, we would not. And so for that purpose, we'll leave it where it is. But I did want to have uh, Carmen and, and Fernando's reaction to your question, which was, is the United States uh, an outlier or in the sort of general uh, process of other courts in, in, in providing this type of disclosure.
Uh, I can start. Uh, in fact, I was was thinking about uh, uh, two aspects here. If uh, if there is any similar uh, provision in the Brazilian law to seek uh, uh, evidences uh, for uh, a party in a foreign case, uh, I have, uh, in fact, answered the question from uh, a colleague uh, in London asking that. In theory, uh, our civil procedure code uh, allows some uh, uh, measures in courts in order to seek documents from a party in aid of a foreign case. But it's going to be very, very difficult. We don't have uh, the, something established as the United States has. And uh, uh, since we don't have a discovery in Brazil, uh, it's going to be even, even more difficult uh, to, to, have a, to obtain such documents from a Brazilian company. But, uh, but there, are, there are mechanisms in the Civil Procedure Code for that. Another aspect, and we discussed that yesterday in our preparation, was uh, how a tribunal will react, uh, uh, arbitration tribunal will mm -hmm. react if a party uh, in the middle of a case uh, it starts uh, uh, a request like that in the U.S. Uh, probably uh, it's going to be uh, uh, something that the tribunal will not uh, appreciate very much. Uh, there are means to obtain documents uh, in the arbitration. I know that uh, in some cases, uh, in the extent of the discovery, uh, it's much broader than, uh, let's say, an arbitration in Brazil or an arbitration elsewhere, or an arbitration where, in which uh, we apply IBA or, or other uh, soft law provisions for, uh, for documents. Uh, but that, that, that's something interesting to be discussed. But it, it can be the subject of a panel. <laughs> Brendan, I know, I know Carmen has something to say, and I'm very interested to hear it. But I just want to pick up on that last point that Fernando raised about the reaction of the arbitral tribunal uh, to a party going to court, um, either without having asked the tribunal in the first place, or worse yet, going to a court for evidence production that the tribunal has disallowed. Uh, there are different scenarios here. But I want to add that in the leading Supreme Court decision, which enumerates the factors which I did not go into, that a court should consider in deciding whether to grant or not a 1782 application. There's one factor that I really want to mention, Fernando, um, that I think is very important. And that factor is the quote unquote receptivity of the tribunal. To what extent is the tribunal receptive? Now, that is an opening, Fernando, for, for the court to try to find out through one means or another what the tribunal's feelings are about this. And while those feelings, if I can call them that, while they're certainly not binding on, on the court, I think the Supreme Court has said, take that into account. And I'll simply finally say that in the restatement, um, we, we underscore that. Um, enormously. And we say, we think it would be best practice. <laughs> it's not for us to say, but we think it would be best practice for a court that is asked to produce evidence <clears throat> for use in a arbitral proceeding to, to check in, to check in with the tribunal beforehand. I'm not saying that's done. I don't think it is. Sorry, Carmen. No, not at all. Um, I, I was actually going to make a, a not not a very dissimilar point, uh, but but uh, perhaps more generally, I think you know, in, in seventeen eighty two applications can work incredibly well, and and of course, Professor Berman reminded us of the of the Chevron Ecuador case where it had such a tremendous um, impact. 
you know, on a fundamental issue that 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 has very much shaped the the legal landscape in the last couple of years. So, you know, that is not to be under under um, underestimated. And you know, uh, very recently in in October of this year, uh, the U.S. District Court for the District of Delaware also granted a, a discovery application under 1782 um, in support of the any Nigeria um, uh, arbitration. Um, this has been reported in in the press, but we we were of course involved in that and, 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 and you know it, it is a powerful tool now does it make sense in every instance no it does not so uh, first and i'm going to go back to the point that both fernando and and george were making but uh, uh, you know uh, uh, think about your arbitral tribunal in you don't want to antagonize your arbitral tribunal and a lot of arbitral tribunals would understand that uh, this is an option that's open to the parties and that they should not feel bad about it. But but some others arbitral tribunal would not see this in the same manner, particularly when they come from a different legal culture, when this is not OK. So be mindful of that. And, and as George was saying, you know, maybe try to build those um that communication with the tribunal in a way that not only serves the purposes that you george were referring to in terms of you know the, the restatement and the supreme court requirements and all of that but also that that is strategic for your case right because it, it's not going to serve a, a lot of uh it's not going to do you a lot of good if you manage to get the certain documents but in the process of doing that you have antagonized the arbitral tribunal against you and the other point is that this costs time it, it can actually be pretty quick and and this recent example that i was mentioning is an example of that but but i've had other instances where it hasn't been quick at all uh, and of course it could cut money uh, so you know i think there was a there was an era where everybody wanted to file a 1782 application particularly if you were in the investor state um world and 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 you know it was why aren't we filing one? And I think things are calming down a little bit now, and people are realizing that while it is a powerful tool in the right case, in the right circumstances, is certainly not for every case. Thank you, um, Carmen. I'm sure I'm actually quite sure that Professor Berman, Carmen, Fernando, and I will continue this discussion <laughs> offline because it is clearly one that's interesting to all of us. But I see that we have used our allotted time and maybe indulged an extra five minutes. So Brandon, can I just intervene here and tell please. you that next week in New York International Arbitration Week, uh, there is going to be a a um, a sort of a let's say a simulated hearing in which this is the issue. All right. So this is on the agenda, uh, where the availability of 1782 in international commercial arbitration will be played out. Uh, next week, I can't recall what day it is. I think it's Friday. I think it's the Fordham event. Very good. I hope the audience will tune in. And, and with that, uh, let me please thank my uh, panelists and the organizers for a great session. And I have been asked to relay the fact that the uh, keynote speech will take place in approximately 10 minutes. And the link to that event is in the description of the current event and most likely also in, in the chat on the right hand side. So with that again, thank you, Fernando Carmen, Professor Berman. It's been my pleasure. Thank all of you. And hope to see you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye.